All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. So I want to thank Dr. Richard Ehrman for coming down from uh, Boston, uh, where he is the Anesthesia Clinical Director for Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He's the Medical Director for Sedation Services for Interventional Medicine, and he's also the Chief of Anesthesia Services at Brigham and Women's Hospital Care Center at Chestnut Hill. He carries a lot of different hats and titles. Uh, he's been in the Boston area. He's been in the Harvard system for almost 21 years now, where he did med school, he completed an MBA, as well as his anesthesia residency, which he did at uh, Beth Israel. That's his real disc deaconess. Uh, clearly entrenched in, uh, in Boston, he also has an uh, adjunct appointment at LSU. I was pretty impressed by that. I think he's just some uh, places to go in the winter. That's, uh, that's impressive. Um, he's also completed fellowships in medical education, quality improvement, as well as um, his, uh, his uh, finance degrees. He's founding director of the Center for Perioperative Research at Brigham and Women's. He's a, pro, he's a program that was developed for interdepartmental collaboration on uh, perioperative research topics. One of the reasons why I thought this would be a great talk. And in his free time, he's published over 350 peer-reviewed articles, not including the books he's edited and the uh, 85 book chapters that he wrote um, or written. I heard, uh, I heard him speak at the New England section last year, which I was really impressed. I thought it was very applicable to a lot of the work that we're doing here and some of the quality improvement projects that we're trying to trying to push forward. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity to have him come. Uh, you know, the, we're not all at the New England section or, you know, the timing of some of the talks. And I didn't think everyone had the privilege of hearing it. So we've invited him to come down and give a talk, which I think would be really beneficial. Thanks for uh, driving down. No, thanks a lot. Make sure this thing works. Yes, it does. Thank you again for inviting me. Um, um, so, uh, what I wanted to just uh, basically talk about is, is an perioperative analgesia. And obviously a lot of it is gonna be in the context of um, ERAS. And I know that you're very involved in ERAS and you're certainly trying to kind of build that program. Um, it's gonna be focused on adults, not pediatrics. But uh, you know, I'm happy to have a discussion about that as well. Uh, let's see, hopefully this will, yeah, it works, good. Uh, so we'll just talk very briefly. We have about what, 45 minutes about the mechanisms underlying different analgesic modalities, some medication specifically, and that's something you know you can you, you know have a discussion with your anesthesia colleagues. You know when we're talking about perioperative analgesia, you know pre-op, intra-op, and post-op, uh, some other techniques and, and approaches to analgesia in general, and some um, evidence-based discussion as well. Um, those are all my conflicts. Um, so, if you look at this uh, slide, this gives you a kind of a nice overview of sort of, you know, what we want to do obviously is to target different parts of the uh, nervous system, right? You know, you got the brain, you got the ascending pathways, uh, dorsal ganglia, and, and sort of gives you a, a list. It's a very nice uh, diagram showing different medication modalities. Some of them are used mostly for chronic pain, but most of these are definitely uh, relevant in the setting of sort of in the acute setting, and then you're talking about Obviously, chronic pain patients who are having surgery, and we'll discuss that in a bit. Uh, so I just kind of want you to see this. This is sort of a great overview, and we'll talk about different, uh, some of these modalities and, and the evidence behind them. And really, the, the issue here is a lot of them we're just not utilizing. We, we know how they work. We know it, they work well, and it makes a difference. We're just not doing it, and the question is why. Um, I find this uh, a very useful diagram. This was published in Anesthesia and Analgesia last year and uh, published by um, an, uh, ERAS, it's an enhanced recovery society called ACER, American Society for Enhanced Recovery, which is different from the ERAS USA Society that I'm involved in. But, uh, and basically they published this very nice, um, it's for colorectal surgery. They don't have one obviously for uh, you know, radical cystectomies or anything like that. Uh, but it's, you know, intended for sort of major abdominal surgeries just to show you, you know, from pre-op, intra-op, post-op, and home, what are some different modalities that are available to you, analgesic modalities. And it basically says, you know, pick uh, more than one from each category. And there are some mandatory things, which I want to point out to, yes, we all, obviously, we're going to focus on all the medications. But on top there, it says, you know, setting realistic expectations for patients when it comes to managing pain, right? Reinforcing expectations and goals, very important. So how well do we do this, right? Okay. This one I created myself. But the point here, and it's sort of a nice visual representation of, 
you know, we, you know, when we talk about opioids, right, uh, we worry about, you know, big stuff like respiratory depression, right? But there's all these other things that happen that affect, you know, patient satisfaction, patient outcomes, uh, length of stay, uh, you know, everything else that we worry about, all these sort of outcomes of interest, you know, way beyond just, you know, respiratory compromise, you know, hyperalgesia, you know, obviously nausea, vomiting, urinary retention, you know, long-term effects of opioids. We know about cancer and, uh, and you know, small things like dizziness, orthostatic uh, hypertension. Next thing you know, people try to get up and they fall and they break something and there you go. Um, so lots of different, uh, potential, you know, side effects that we know about and delirium and confusion. I'll show you another slide on that. Um, something that at least from the anesthesiologist perspective, we care about, but we don't really see these patients post-operatively. And that's something that basically going to be on, you know, up to you to, to manage and, and, and make sure that you, you know, you optimize their post-op outcomes. Okay. Very good. Um, we wrote this paper a couple of years ago, and what we did, it was this interesting exercise. Um, I had one of my research fellows who was interested in, in ERAS. I said, why don't we look at major institutions? I can't remember if Yale's um, protocol was, was, it was, we reviewed it or not. We looked at colorectal surgery, different ERAS protocols that were available to us from major academic centers. And we said, can we just compare what they, you know, that was from just a couple of years ago, you know, pre-op, intra-op, post-op. And what are they writing? I mean, are they similar? Are they different? What we realized, this is just some examples. They were very different. You know, you look at preoperative, one protocol had nothing, no recommendation for preoperative analgesics. Some had gabapentin and then the dosing, we can discuss that, you know, and some had uh, acetaminophen and it's just all over the place. And the same for intra-op and post-op, right? I mean, I don't think you're surprised, but that's what we see, right? Um, and basically, the button here is a little, okay. Um, and, you know, some of it is because we just don't know about the efficacy of some of these medications. I mean, we know they work, they're analgesics. But in terms of their impact on overall recovery in the setting of ERAS, and I think that partially explains it, and partially is just because people are just writing their own thing. Um, and we don't really know what, what the ideal analgesic regimen is. Um, so very briefly, I'll just go over some of the major classes, and mostly not that, you know, we obviously know about them. It's more about the evidence behind them. Uh, and maybe that can explain why, you know, we have such a difference in, in how these uh, ERAS protocols are being written, right? So for NSAIDs, uh, we give NSAIDs routinely to patients, you know, Celebrex, Celecoxib, two to 400 milligrams. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they have lots of interesting properties, right? I mean, I know they're COX-2 inhibitors, right? But there's been lots of literature showing, you know, they have uh, this anti-emetic effect. There's better patient satisfaction. People look at all these secondary outcomes and uh, develop, attenuate development opioid tolerance as well. Uh, and they antagonize NMDA receptors. So all of these mechanisms that are really, you know, favorable. Um, and there are different options available if you're talking about intravenous um, delivery, right? There's some cost differences, obviously. Um, you know, we always worry about bleeding. Um, there's some literature, mostly in emergency uh, colorectal surgery on anastomotic leaks in patients who got NSAIDs, which I think these studies were poorly done. And that's, we, most of us agree that it's probably not significant. Uh, it, you know, how does it apply to, you know, radical cystectomy is some of the bowel resections that you do. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, some sort of potential for cardiovascular risk, even with short-term use. Um, and I just want to point out to you that, yes, you know, if you go from um, uh, COX-2 selectivity, right, from irreversible effects like aspirins to the least, to the most selective one like Celecox, that there are some intravenous options. Some are still under development like meloxicam IV, that there are definitely some options out there if that's a concern. Um, some are generic, mostly, most of them aren't. Um, ketamine, and again, we know about its properties, but somehow I don't see it being used widely in the operating room or even post-operatively. And that's something, you know, discussion you obviously want to have with your anesthesia colleagues, why is that? And the same for lidocaine, which I'll, IV lidocaine, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, you know, we know how it works. It reduces hyperalgesic response that induced by opioids. Lots of meta-analyses out there showing, you know, as much as 40% reduction in opioid consumption, pain, improvement in pain scores, you know, less rescue analgesia, less opioids, PO and V. So all of these really great 
things. I mean, there are obviously some side effects, right, of ketamine, uh, like psychomimetic effects, sedation, even in small amounts, uh, tachycardia as well. But these are all transient effects. And so, um, you know, we, it's part of our ERAS protocol for these, you know, bigger procedures, you know, radical cystectomies, colorectal, you know, surgeries. Uh, we give a bolus, and that's part of the protocol. It, am I saying that we do this routinely and we give it to every appropriate patient? Not every patient is appropriate, but most of them are, and we don't. We still don't. But uh, there's no reason why you, you really couldn't give this routinely to, to all of your patients who are appropriate candidates uh, and even run it post-operatively. You can do it for up to two days uh, in the PACU as well as on the floor. Um, and that's been shown very effective to, you know, for a variety of reasons. The same for lidocaine infusions. Um, how often do you see lidocaine infusions or ketamine infusions post-op on your patients? Right. Uh, again, and not just analgesic properties, anti-inflammatory properties. I mean, local anesthetics have been studied extensively, so I'm not saying anything that you already didn't know. Uh, you know, appropriate for maybe all patients, you know, chronic pain patients, you can decide, you know, patients who are definitely at risk of opioid tolerance and hyperalgesia. Um, and again, you know, you run an intraop infusion, um, you know, as we move away from epidurals, and we'll talk about that, I mean, this is becoming even more appropriate and less controversial. You know, people always ask, well, can I run a lidocaine infusion and an epidural? But say if you're not doing it, so there's even less reason not to, to uh, use lidocaine infusions, including using it postoperatively and very good safety profile. I mean, it's, it's very uh, unusual to have, a, you know, like a cardiac arrest or something like that from that. Um, and uh, again, you can run it postoperatively as well. And uh, it can even be given in addition to uh, local and, um, blocks, nerve blocks that you're administering, for example, or even um, uh, wound infiltration. Um, do you have liposomal bupivacaine here? You do. Okay. It depends on the hospital. Some get into it. Okay. Well, some places don't. Mass General doesn't have IV acetaminophen and liposomal bupivacaine, but Brigham does, and we're part of the same system, so it just depends. It comes down to the money, obviously, uh, and outcomes, hopefully. Um, but there's extensive literature on it, right? So um, it lasts up to three days, and we're using it a lot. And incidentally, the reason that the hospital agreed to purchase liposomal bupivacaine, which is exactly uh, 100 times more expensive than bupivacaine, um, is because there was this drug shortage of local anesthetics and opioids and everything. It was a couple of years ago. And then after that, they just kind of let us use it for nerve blocks and for wound infiltration as well. And it's been studied extensively in all sorts of blocks. Uh, some studies are not great. Certainly the wound infiltration studies are not, but some of the nerve blocks, some of these studies are actually pretty good quality. Um, and, you know, everything, all these outcomes of interest, you know, POMB, improved activity levels, and everything else that we care about in the setting of ERAS definitely have been shown to be improved in, with some of the nerve blocks with, with um, liposomal bupivacaine. Um, and uh, this, I just wanted to have this slide. There are different options available for tab blocks. And what I see our urologists for these radical cystectomies, we used to put epidurals in as of a couple of years ago, we stopped and they try to do their own blocks or get us to do these blocks. So there's tab blocks, there's squadron lamborum blocks, which, you know, can cover more area. You know, there's pros and cons. Again, we're not going to uh, discuss all the details, but, you know, just the top line, basically, that you can get more coverage. You know, if you either do a subcostal tab block or you can do a QL block. There are different approaches, but you can actually go above the belly button, which oftentimes, if your incision is above that, is very helpful, especially as we, some people say, well, we don't want to do epidurals anymore. That's a pretty decent alternative, you know, and, you know, the question is, um, yeah, and then, you know, some advantages and disadvantages uh, in terms of, you know, how easy it is to perform. So the key is to have um, anesthesiologists willing to do it, right? And then the question is, what some institutions have done now is they do the block under the drapes, so almost like instead of doing it post-op, uh, after you, after you uh, close the incision, but before you take the patient out, traditionally, this is when we've done these blocks. So you get the anesthesiologist to do it, whether you're doing catheters or simple shot, and, you know, it takes about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. People have complained, well, it delays our next case, you know, with turnovers of 55 minutes to begin with, you're adding another 30 minutes on top of this. We don't want to do this. So some institutions, not us, they would do the block uh, 
before the incision, but like as you start draping, we basically get under there with the ultrasound. We don't do it that way, but that's another option to save time and provide, you know, adequate analgesia for your patients. Um, and uh, obviously, the next question is, and we have colorectal surgeons, GYN oncologists, and some urologists as well, doing some of these blocks themselves, infiltrating the fascia intraoperatively without involving anesthesia. And it's certainly become a standard of care pretty much at the Brigham for colorectal and for GYN onc. So they do all of them themselves. We can talk about the outcomes and the differences, but you know, but definitely this is the way at least for at least what I see at my institution and many other institutions are going away from epidurals. Um, I found this paper. There's definitely some urology, like radical, radical cystectomy related literature. I'm sort of, in my opinion, you know, similar to say the colorectal resections in some ways when you're looking at, you know, because there's just not a lot of literature on, in, in urology on this specifically. So they, they basically study the use of uh, uh, TAP catheters in the setting of an ERAS program pre and post. I feel like there were a lot of core morbidities. You're probably, I'm sure you're familiar with this paper a lot of co co uh, confounders, sorry. But they basically did a pre and post ERAS um, implementation. There was a retrospective study. Um, and basically patients in the ERAS cohort, they got a tab block with catheters and they looked at, you know, outcomes of interest, you know, uh, you know, flatus and bowel movements and length of stay. And they found some significant differences um, in a cohort that had tab blocks, to be fair, obviously there were many other interventions that happened in the ERAS cohort, right? So it's hard to kind of tease out whether it was really related to the tab block or some other things. You know, it's hard to control it in a sort of a non-prospective study. But nonetheless, it showed significant difference uh, with the use of tab blocks. But no difference in complications or readmission rates. And you see this in a lot of studies that sort of your primary interest and, in, you know, especially in radical cystectomies where complication rates are pretty high, um, you know, um, it, it didn't show any difference. But again, it all depends on how you do the study, right? Um, epidurals, I mentioned, and this is something that comes up at all of the ERAS meetings. You know, we do these debates, pro and con. It's also always lots of fun. You know, you know, epidural good or not, right? And that, that's how I train, certainly. And now I haven't done one in a couple of years, uh, actually. We're not being asked to do them, so I have to go and do OB epidurals because I just don't get to do them. None of us do. And at least our institution moved away from this. And, you know, there are some clear benefits. Uh, mostly been studied in, you know, large intra-abdominal surgeries. And, you know, and I have question signs there because, yes, a lot of evidence certainly shows, you know, superior pain relief. Well, compared to what, right? Compared to a PCA? Sure, compared to a tab block, that's a different question. And I'll show you a slide on that. Um, you know, stress response, yes. Um, you know, uh, you know, cardiopulmonary complications, sure. So all of this makes sense. And that's been shown again and again in the literature. But there's also all these uh, downsides to epidurals, which we've always known about. But, uh, you know, more recently, especially as we kind of think more about ERAS and how it impacts postoperative recovery, and certainly from the anesthesiologist's perspective, where we focus a lot on the intraoperative uh, period and not really on the postoperative period where you're trying to get your patients out of bed and get them out of the hospital, you know, it becomes even more of an issue, right? In terms of limited mobility and all these other things. Hypertension, obviously, is one of the biggest ones. I think it's slightly exaggerated, honestly, but it certainly happens. And that, you know, you end up getting more fluid and then all these other, you know, uh, consequences of that that happen, uh, but it certainly is an issue. And I think it's one of the main reasons why, other than failure, which I don't have on that, maybe I do, um, is, is, is that, that a lot of surgeons have moved away from, uh, from epidurals, um, mostly because of you know, hypertension and you know, other things like that. Um, this is an interesting study, a couple of studies actually, going back to liposomal bupivacate. So the question is, can you get away with a tab block, which, so the big difference is, right, that you're not, there's no visceral pain coverage, right? We always, for, you know, I don't want to say centuries, but for a long time since we had epidurals, we said, well, epidurals are great because you get, you know, visceral coverage, you know, versus you're talking about a tab block where you don't. So in theory, you should have better pain relief. But what we're seeing in GYN oncology, and we presented this, it was one of the GYN oncologists at the, your AUA meeting, your regional meeting in Rhode Island, 
he presented some data that basically shows that, uh, yeah, these patients, you know, they do tab locks, surgeons do the tab locks with liposomal bupivacaine, and these patients have no pain requiring minimal opioids. They haven't published it yet. So this whole like question of, well, that is coverage of visceral pain that important? Because clearly they're doing tab locks themselves and they're not having a lot of pain, these patients after these big, you know, x labs. We're talking about, you know, big oncology cases. So this is just a couple of studies that were published uh, recently in the anesthesia literature and Cochrane database uh, comparing liposomal bupivacaine to bupivacaine modalities. And one interesting study was tab blocks with, lipo, tab block with liposomal bupivacaine by an anesthesiologist versus a thoracic epidural, which is used to argue the standard of care, was major low abdominal colorectal surgery. And they basically found this was a well done study. I mean, it was a retrospective study. I give you that. But you know, similar pain scores, opioid consumption. Um, you know, so a lot of the outcomes that we all care about were actually very similar. Um, people have also studied, this is a Cochrane review, right? So wound infiltration with liposomal versus bupivacaine showed some benefits. You know, not a lot though. This one was actually not really that much difference. Um, but that's just wound infiltration. So is it worth 300 bucks that you spend on it? That's a different question. Um, and then liposomal bupivacaine wound infiltration versus tab block with a bupivacaine. That's an even more interesting study. That was an abdominal hysterectomy. So kind of a, it was an actually a decent study. And it showed lower pain uh, scores and opioid requirements with liposomal bupivacaine. Just wound infiltration. We're not even talking about tab blocks. Especially if you don't want to do it yourselves and you don't have an anesthesiologist who is able or willing to do it. You know, that might be a, 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 an option for you to, to provide more pain control for your patient, especially given these results. I may not be a neurology specifically, but I'm trying to get as close as I can to, to, uh, to that. But, um, and there are some other interesting drugs. Um, since I'm involved with FDA, you know, we see all these local anesthetics on the, you know, trying to get FDA approval that, you know, have a lot of potential, I think, even just for wound infiltration because they last a long time. All right, so, so then I looked at ERAS guidelines for radical cystectomies. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. The problem with this, it's a 2013 paper, right? So it, it's time for updating it. Usually we just updated the colorectal ERAS guidelines. You know, you should be doing it every three years, I think, in my opinion. Certainly, I think it's in the works, but it's way overdue. So it's just interesting because, um, again, it's not, it's slightly outdated, but you know, they basically said, well, there's no prospective single intervention studies, so the highest quality studies really uh, to, and, and this is specifically about epidural. So EDA is epidural analgesia, right? So this is the sort of, you can look at it. That's where it came from. Um, and they're basically saying, yes, your guidelines, somewhat, not your guidelines, but these guidelines somewhat contradict what, what the literature is saying now. Um, you know, epidurals, yeah, they, you know, thoracic epidurals, they improve outcomes. But a lot of the data, and they admit it, is based on colorectal surgery, not cystectomies. Um, and uh, so I think this, you know, we, we need to look at it and probably update it because, again, the quotes here says thoracic epidural is an integral part of existing fast track protocols in urology. And it also says, given similarities, so a lot of it, they're basically extrapolating from low rectal and bladder surgery. And... Uh, they're basically recommending thoracic epidural. So what I'm saying is there's some inconsistency here, what the current guidelines are saying, which need to be updated versus what some of the evidence of some current practices are pointing to. So it's, we need to kind of you know, continue this discussion. And um, this, I just wanted you to have this. Uh, it does pertain to urology, but just to tell you that there's really interesting website. It's called Prospect. It's basically um, a not a society, but a consortium. It's based in Europe. It consists of some really well-known anesthesiologists and surgeons like Henry Kellett, who is you know, the founding, one of the founders, so the founder, I think, of the ERAS movement from Denmark. And they basically do all this evidence-based literature search and post uh, outcomes based on a specific procedure. And what they argue is that instead of, that we need to customize the analgesic regimen to a specific procedure based on the evidence that we have. Right. So that's their argument. So whatever procedure you're involved in, you know, radical prostatectomy, for example, what is the evidence? It's a pretty useful website that you should check out. Um, uh, I forget if they have anything on radical cystectomies, but um, again, uh, I know it's work in progress. Just a few more medications that come up. Um, 
uh, gabapentinoids. Um, do you use them preoperatively? You give it to your patients for at least for big procedures. Yeah. Yes, you do. So great. Uh, we used to we used to believe those were like really awesome medications, and now we're not using it as much for obvious reasons, side effects. I mean, we know how they work, right? And we know that there's anti hyperalgesic, analgesic properties, you know, anxiolytic properties, all these good things about gabapentinoids, right? There's gabapentin, there's pregabalin. Pregabalin is, is, is actually a better drug. It kicks in faster, especially in an acute setting. It's more expensive, right? It's Lyrica, which I believe is gonna become generic very soon. Um, so it's gonna be a better drug, hopefully cheap enough. Um, the question always comes up, what's the optimal dose, right? And the reason I put out 1,200, every time I say, well, you should really give 1,200 if you wanna have an analgesic effect, oh, 1,200. Well, yeah, because then you know you get the analgesic effect, assuming it's adjusted properly for age and renal function, but then you start having all these sort of side effects like respiratory and, and things like that, right? Uh, but the um, the amounts that we, the dosages that we use, which is I showed you that slide with the different protocols, 300, it's not very effective, um, and it, it really doesn't do much, in my opinion. And then the question is, do you just give one dose or do you dose or do you give two, three, or whatever postoperatively? Um, and uh, yeah, so it is, it's dose dependent, right? So, um, and um, there is, yeah, sorry, I, I'm, I'm wrong. So the uh, uh, pregabalin is available, I believe now. Um, so I thought it was 2020, but. So anyways, so we're not using it as frequently and we had some complications, mostly in elderly patients who got even 300, but honestly to have a real analgesic effect, you gotta give a lot, like 900, and most people aren't willing to do it unless they're young and healthy people, which not my, our patient population, I'm sure not yours either. Um, a few other drugs that I know this is something that anesthesiologists would give, but I think it would, as you think about your protocols, right? So, uh, you know, as you work with your, your anesthesia colleagues to think about all these other modalities, which we know they exist and they work and they're effective, they're cheap um, and pretty safe, yet we're not doing it. I mean, that's the biggest question. I already asked this question is why we're not using some of these non-opioid modalities. And magnesium is easy, right? I mean, and, and it's been studied, reduces post-op pain, opioid consumption. There's some NMDA, just like ketamine. There's some actually ketamine-like, um, action as well, which we know is beneficial. Um, you know, maybe get some transient hypertension, whatever, but not the amounts that you're using. You're talking about maybe a cumulative dose of like three grams or something like that. Um, and you can bolus, you can run an infusion intraoperatively. It reduces, uh, lowers blood pressure, which is good because what you see intraoperatively, a lot of times the anesthesia people are just gonna be standing there and pushing opioids more and more because they're hypertensive, they're in pain, even though they're asleep and they're clearly not feeling that pain yet people are just going to do that so why not you know run magnesium it will lower the blood pressure and prevent you from just reflexively you know pushing more and more dilated or whatever it is uh, and we do this i mean in laparoscopic surgery as well as open surgery as well and uh, you know you just don't want to give too much and you call muscle uh, cause muscle weakness obviously beta blockers that's another one esmolo has been studied actually and it's been shown to Compared to opioids, you know, the couple of interesting studies showing, yeah, patients who got esmolol, you know, uh, all things being equal, you know, less nausea, less pain, more rapid discharge of these, you know, ambulatory patients. Uh, and so why not? Why not use it as an infusion, esmolol infusion, for example, it will lower heart rate, blood pressure. You Again, going to be less likely, less tempted to give opioids. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of advantage to this and it's short acting. So you know, the margin of error is pretty good. Uh, tramadol is not available, but you see this in some of the European guidelines. Maybe they'll approve it someday, but it's not a great drug. Uh, and some people argue, well, it's still an opioid, really. And I know our surgeons prescribe a lot of uh, PO tramadol, actually. Not a lot, but some. I don't know if you do, but I mean, it's got its own issues, including addiction issues, actually. So it's not a clean drug, but I just wanted to have it here because you see it in some of the guidelines. Um, so we'll just move on. Um, Alpha-2 agonists, again, we all know about dexmedetomidine, clonidine, um, yet we don't use it routinely and we, don't, we use it very infrequently and despite some of its sort of sedative effects. Um, 
and some hypertension, potentially things that we don't want to see. Again, you know, it's got some anti-hyperalgesic effects, reduces opioid consumption significantly and all of these other outcomes. And why not, you know, use it on a select number of patients as well? It's pretty cheap now. It's generic. Um, so why not? And again, we don't use it routinely. Uh, Tylenol comes up a lot. There's some literature, some urology related literature. There's lots of literature out there, lots of systematic reviews. And that's another thing. The good news is uh, um, the patent is due to expire this year, actually, uh, IV acetaminophen. So and do you, are you using it now? Um, yeah, so for our hospital, it took a while to get it because it was perceived to be expensive. Um, but so it's sort of, it's a non-issue now. The question is, does it really make a difference? I don't know. From a, from a um, sort of pharmacokinetic uh, uh, perspective, yes. You, get, you reach CN, uh, CNS, central nervous system, much faster, you know, IV versus PO. So in theory, yes. But a lot of the systematic reviews, uh, you know, looking at length of stay, opioid consumption, pain scores, there's lots of studies out there. You know, even I did a couple of them. You know, I did one actually in radical uh, prostatectomies, which showed a difference in like tacky length of stay and things like that. Even that was a stretch. But, um, but you know, most systematic reviews actually don't show that there was that much difference. Um, and, uh, you know, but, you know, obviously if they can't take POs, that's a different story. But so it's, it's still a question. But I do believe that it should be part of the U.S. protocol. I, I view acetaminophen around the clock for at least a day or maybe two days. Um, especially now that it's becoming really cheap. Uh, but, you know, a lot of studies have shown reduced pain scores and things like that. So it sort of makes sense. Um, uh, and this is just a study that we did. I just wanted you to show, to see that a lot of these are sort of based on large databases and things like that. And this one, we studied hysterectomies and uh, C-sections and, you know, looking at outcomes of interest. There's a large database we did, uh, including, you know, opioid-related adverse events and things like that. So. Anyways, literature is all over the place. Um, just to very quickly, um, uh, how much more time? We have maybe another 15 minutes, maybe? Uh, 10? Okay, very good. So some other things, you know, I've been involved with some of these clinical trials, some other opioid type molecules that are under development. So we'll see maybe a couple of years from now, Maybe something will come up in front of the FDA, not just another version of oxycodone, which I just came from an FDA meeting, and that's what they're trying to do, another oxycodone type of medication to get on the market, versus something that's definitely less addictive and doesn't have any of the side effects, you know, in terms of, you know, all the sort of new opioid side effects that we don't want to see. So these things are under development, you know, kappa opioid agonists and things like that. It actually don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So these things are under development. Some... Uh, opioid receptor modulators. So there's really nothing right now because what we see is that what we realize is that they're actually very weak. That yes, they do have an analgesic effects, but they're not strong enough. Um, so that's still work in progress. What I have, what I've seen at least up to date. Um, steroids um, again have been studied extensively uh, for analgesia, uh, analgesic anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, we know about this, um, and uh, you know we don't really use them. I mean, we use a little bit for nausea, right, dexamethasone. But the point I'm trying to make, if you really want to be, go multimodal all the way, you really got to give a lot more than what your anesthesiologist did, which is four milligrams for nausea, right? You got to give at least twice as much, if not more, if you want to base it on weight. And the same for methylprednisolone uh, that's been studied actually in orthopedic surgery. And Henry Kellett is a big proponent of that. And basically, uh, you know, it reduces opioid consumption, all of these things. So steroids are actually good. You worry about infections and things like that. So in most patients, including hyperglycemia, it really hasn't been shown to be the case that you give a one-time dose, you know, a decent amount of uh, steroid, like 30 milligram equivalent of dexamethasone. So I think it's worth considering in a, in a uh, subset of your patients. Um, a lot of interesting things uh, coming up. Uh, and that's one of the studies that we're doing, basically, uh, with one of the genomics companies. Uh, and, and we all know this, right, that there's a, a huge genetic variability. And it's been studied extensively in terms of opioid response in patients, how much there's lots of these genetic variants out there. But it's also true for non-opioids, right? 
It's also true for local anesthetics. I mean, people have found all these mutations in people, in patients, you know, from acetaminophen, all of these drug classes that we just discussed. There's actually different levels of responses. So we published this paper working with one of the uh, companies that does this, actually does these preoperative uh, testings to see, you know, looking at metabolizers, different levels of metabolism in the general population, surgical population. And, you know, you can generate these reports looking at every possible drug, including non-opioids and non-analgesics even. And you can see, you know, whether it translates into real clinical significance, that's a different question, but you can ultimately customize your analgesic regimen for these patients. And, you know, routinely genotyping them and, you know, doing some of these tests are actually not that complicated. There are companies that do this and actually bill Medicare for it. Um, so that's just something for the future. So last five minutes, five or 10 minutes, I just wanted to talk about pathways and um, we'll just skip this one. But, um, uh, but well, basically this picture shows, we published this again, just the point here is you've got to develop a pathway uh, for your patients, whether they're opioid naive patients or opioid users, um, you know, and hopefully get them upstream, right? When they, the first surgery starts being contemplated and kind of have, you know, and, and, and work with a pre-op clinic, you know, primary care and so on to kind of manage their uh, opioid, uh, uh, their pain management, uh, their uh, pain. Um, a subset of your patients, and if you're just looking at the literature that's out there, what's, what, what is the percentage of patients who are on opioids? I mean, uh, it's, it's actually pretty significant, right? I mean, based on the literature that we have, depends on the you know, surgeries and things like that. But, you know, it's as high as, you know, 10, 15% of patients. It depends on your patient population are using opioids. And that's a very difficult group of patients that we have to deal with, right? And you, you obviously want to work with the anesthesia colleagues. And it's clearly associated with people who are on opioids to begin with, right? Increased length of stay, you know, complications, readmission rates, all of these things. So you want to optimize their care and optimize their analgesic regimen. And again, you, you have to work with your anesthesia colleagues uh, to try to maybe do some opioid reduction strategies or even just stopping opioids is easier said than done, you know, before uh, surgery. And, you know, some literature shows, you know, reduction goal should be maybe reduce it by 50% before having surgery. It clearly has you'll have improved outcomes. Uh, that's kind of the whole point of this and uh, certainly post-operative management. Um, so these are all, again, patients who are, you know, chronic pain patients, patients on opioids, and how important it is to kind of have a really good follow-up and multidisciplinary approach to these patients, which is what we do. We even have a preoperative service now in the pre-op clinic where we see patients who are referred by the surgeons in the pre-op clinic a couple of weeks before surgery who are chronic pain patients on opioid and we basically see them do a consultation and write like a plan basically for them some on a suboxone and things like that this i borrowed i, I use this figure actually for my grants you know related to opioids and this was published by orthopedic surgeons from my institution from the brigham it's very cool and they just devised this and they studied it this sort of a five-step ladder uh, um, to limit post-operative opioid prescribing to patients you know, and it's basically, you know, based on the sort of intensity of the surgery, you know, so, and you can do the same for your, uh, your specialty as well. And they said, okay, let's implement this. Let's get a buy-in from all our surgeons and a look at the outcomes in terms of reduced number of opioids being prescribed, you know, secondary prescriptions, you know, and things like that. And they actually showed, so all I'm saying is there's probably a way for you to look into this and see how can we design this, maybe integrate it into your uh, you have Epic, I know, uh, into Epic, and, and, and uh, well, maybe you already have this, but certainly something that they did, I think, is pretty unique, and it showed some really good outcomes. Um, just going back to uh, chronic pain patients, Suboxone comes up a lot, and I, I assume you defer to your anesthesia colleagues. There's all these different ones, and it's, you don't always have to stop it. That's the whole point. We put together this guideline a while ago. Uh, but the half-life is really long and, you know, you have to really, I think it, it's, it's something you have to work with the anesthesia people to see what, how you want to manage this because it can become a real issue post-operatively, um, whether you stop it or not. Um, this is interesting. So this was published by this, again, this Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Society, ACER Society. Uh, and this is a nice little score. I, I don't know how practical it is, but it's very simple to use, so it probably is practical. 
Um, and this is uh, basically classification scheme to categorize patients into low, moderate, and high risk groups based on opioid use or no use, right? So you basically have three categories when you see these patients. So opioid, again, this is in the setting of enhanced recovery. So all of this is related to that. So you got opioid naive patients, exposed patients, you're gonna have to calculate the morphine equivalents per day, and then opioid tolerant patients, so they really on a lot of opioids. And I basically devised this scheme, this sort of grading system, and I said, okay, let's look at the, the outcome is opioid related adverse events, right? And basically they said, even if you're opioid naive, which would be that yellow one, but if you have one of these modifiers, so this modify matrix, basically, if they have any of these psychiatric issues like depression, anxiety, bipolar, or substance use disorder, even if they're opioid naive, according to the definition, or surgeries associated with persistent pain, which is quite a few surgeries, you know, then they're going to be high risk for AEs, even if they're opioid naive. But certainly as you're getting into opioid exposed or opioid tolerant patients, it becomes more of an issue. So something for you to kind of think about how you want to manage these patients. Um, so I'm just going to quickly skip this so we have time for questions. But I want to show you something that I borrowed from one of our urologists. So uh, let me go back to this. Um, and this is part of this. So we have this uh, e EAIS system, uh, ERAS Interactive Audit System. So we're part of the ERAS network. There are only three institutions right now in the U.S. There's quite a few in Europe. And the system is based in Sweden. Uh, and it's a, uh, basically a way to collect data about your ERAS patients, right? And so it's, it, it, they have all, I mean, you have your own dashboards. I'm sure there are all these metrics that you care about, but this is specifically focused on ERAS protocols and compliance. And since we're talking about pain management, right? I don't think I have a yellow, but anyways, on the intra-op compliance, you know, you can basically look at, you know, use of regional anesthesia, local infiltration, epidural, and look at basically month by month compliance, right? So uh, green is good, yellow is not so good, and, and red is really not good, or pink, whatever. Um, and that's true for everything else, but since we're just talking about pain. And so what you can do with this system is to basically look at opioid um, administration, right? So it calculates MEEs uh, month by month. So it says, so the, the blue line is uh, median uh, oral morphine equivalents, first 24 hours, how much these patients are getting, and then, you know, 24 to 48 hours. We find, you know, things just, a lot of times on the floors, people are just getting stuff you know, just because maybe some people aren't trained or whatever it is, and people are just getting a lot of opioids in the pack here and on the floor, even we're trying to do a good job intraoperatively. So you can basically uh, look at this and, and see how your department is doing. And you can do the same thing by surgeon. Uh, you know, first 24 hours, you know, what's going on in terms of opioid administration. You're really trying to reduce it, and you, know, you see this variability, no surprise. Um, um, and I think it's a great system. Uh, that we have for uh, now for about five, six service lines, colorectal, urology, uh, GYN, onc, and so on. And, you know, ultimately we're talking about opioid-free analgesia. And uh, we published this paper because it was interesting. What we're curious about is to see how many institutions are doing, truly doing opioid-free analgesia. That's sort of OFA. If you Google that or PubMed it three years ago, there'll be like no papers on it. Um, and now it's a hot topic is can we get away with no opioids? You know, maybe it's doing a tab block and giving, you know, lidocaine, ketamine and all of these things and get away with no opioids. So we, we uh, use a large database, uh, like a billing database, Premier. And we basically, so it's got its own limitations, but we were just curious to see who is actually not giving any opioids. You can tell. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. It says, you know, there were lots of missed opportunities. Very few institutions are doing it. Um, and uh, so it was just like a few places. So it, it's very limited. That's all I'm going to say. Um, it was an interesting thing. And obviously, we have to think about all of these sort of non additional non medication modalities, right? Non, non um, uh, you know, from you know, CBD to all the other stuff, acupuncture, you know. Um, everything else, you know, biofeedback. These things have been, you know, studied actually. And some of them, have been, you know, music therapy actually has been shown to be effective in reducing stress, anxiety, and, and uh, opioid use and pain scores. Um, so, you know, something to consider, maybe not all of them, but at least pick one or two. Reiki we do for some patients preoperatively. You know, you have to train people to do it. So something to think about. Definitely there, there's benefit in these. 
So just to conclude, uh, if you're interested, I'm very involved with the ERAS USA Society. So we're having our, our World Congress. It's for the first time combining the International ERAS Society and ERAS USA. It's going to be in New Orleans the end of August. Uh, so it will probably be about 700 people coming from all over the world. So if you're interested, certainly urology, it's a very, it's an active group. And if you're interested in getting more involved, uh, please come. And I think that's it. Thank you. You mentioned uh, a 300 milligram dose of gabapentin is too little. I mean, what, what should we be using then in our pre as our preoperative dosing? What would you recommend? If 1,200 is a lot, but it's a one-time dose preoperatively. Is that appropriate? And then if we're putting people on it for a few days yeah. afterward, how do we kind of strike that balance? I mean, I usually start them at 300 BID and see what they need and then go up from there. But if that's sure. not doing anything, how do I? I right. Know. It's definitely what the literature that I reviewed, and there's lots of systematic reviews, you can look at it, there's lots of stuff out there, but the conclusion is, as, as you go up, you have an increased analgesic effect and increased complications. Uh, obviously, you have to adjust for age. I mean, we had some complications where these elderly ortho, ortho patients would get, you know, even 300, and then they just wouldn't wake up. Um, so one question is, should we give more than one dose, right? Should we, uh, you know, so do you just do give one or do you usually like do it every six, eight hours or whatever, eight hours? I think the initial pre-op is a single dose. And then um, I do mostly prostatectomy. So I have patients with some sort of anterior thigh pain sometimes. And so I will give them some post-operative pain complaint of it. Otherwise, I don't routinely give it post -op. Yeah, most people do one. But it's, it's definitely, I think, you know, we should probably consider giving more than one. But all I'm saying is 300 milligrams is not as effective as people think. That's all I'm trying to say. So the more you give, the more analgesic properties you have. So is it un unreasonable? No. You know, adjusted for age and, and uh, renal function. Uh, but that, that's really the point I was trying to make, that 300 is probably still you're going to have enough complications that you have to think about risk and benefit. Uh, but the analgesic effects are not as significant as people think. Uh, it's obviously a pretty decent analgesic, but you got to give like six, nine hundred. If you review some of the anesthesia literature, that's what they'll tell you. But they'll also say, well, worry about the complications. So that's why we actually be have become a lot less aggressive in, in giving it to all our patients preoperatively because of the complications and sort of lack of real effic analgesic efficacy, 300 dose. So th thanks for coming to give the talk. I, th I think it's interesting for us to see kind of the expanded armamentarium of options that we just don't use. I saw a patient recently in the ED that had gotten IV lidocaine, which I had, just hadn't seen, and I didn't really know we were using it. It sounds like it's getting more common in the ER, and you obviously spoke about it. Do you think safety-wise for post-operative care? I mean, obviously, it's cardiac toxicity, but it sounds like not such a concern. It's not. It certainly has a very, you know, wide therapeutic index. So it's, we haven't, I mean, is it, Theoretically possible, yes. I mean, at the rate that we give it, it's it's pretty safe. Um, if we run it in a PACU, it's usually not an issue. Obviously, there's sort of an organizational piece that has to be in place for this. Ketamine, as well as uh, lidocaine, is to basically have uh, PACU people on board, the nurses, um, you know, and we run them on the floors as well. Um, uh, I take it back. Ketamine we run on the floor, but not, not lidocaine. So we haven't been able to get all of the sort of administrative pieces together. So in the PACU, we do because we have anesthesia presence there, right? So we have an anesthesia attending and nurse has been trained to kind of, you know, take care of it. Um, but we should be doing more of it. There, there's no reason why, you know, especially that as we move away from epidurals, uh, you know, the good question, the question is, well, if, if I gave, you know, liposomal bupivacaine, is that okay? We don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Maybe it's more of a practical question. So if you had to have your optimal choice, if you were going to design how we do our post-op care, what, what should we kind of prioritize and what we should start moving towards as we move away from opioids? Should we, should yeah. we just start with episomal bupivacaine? Should we try to get them to a ketamine on the floor? I mean, obviously, we have to get buy-in from our anesthesia colleagues, but yeah. who needs to kind of practical approach? What, what's the, what's the, what would be your top choice of something we should implement? I think, you know, starts with sort of preoperative, right? So, you know, we routinely give uh, celecoxib to thinking about, you know, radical cystectomies, prostatectomies. We, uh, you know, we don't give gabapentin anymore, certainly not to urology patients. Um, but it's not an unreasonable option, to be honest with you. You just have to be careful. 
um, intraoperatively. Um, so you got my post-op or? Yeah. So I guess you're up. Right, right. Yeah, right. I don't think many people are even using COX-2 inhibitors anymore, right? I mean, is anybody you're using? So we've gotten to what, yeah. Yeah, so as many different modalities as you can. And that's going back to my original slide with all these sort of different options. So uh, gabapentin maybe, celecoxib uh, preoperatively, intraoperatively, uh, local anesthetic, which would be the tap walk, uh, for example. Uh, so that would be my path. We're thinking about, say, a radical cystectomy, IV acetaminophen, um, and then do it around the clock for at least a day or two. Um, you know, I mean, opioids maybe. Um, and then run either a ketamine or a lidocaine infusion. Do we do it routinely? No, but I think that's, uh, you know, if you're going to be a tap block, then you can't use lidocaine. So I would either give a bolus of ketamine intraoperatively, even run a, like a low dose ketamine infusion intraoperatively. Uh, so that covers you. That's pretty much, you know, you got NSAIDs, acetaminophen, gabapentin, maybe local anesthetic, uh, an MDA. So ketamine, that's at least four or five different modalities. Um, what else was there? Am I forgetting anything? Uh, but but all the other things I mentioned. Yeah, we do. It depends on the incision. Sometimes I, mean, I use local for every incision. Sometimes the less less taps, more just. Yeah. Have you measured your outcomes? Like, uh, I mean, does it sound like people are using less opioids? And yeah. Yeah, and that's what we've seen with. Tab blocks, yeah, yeah. With the, with the, at least with the oncology, with the GYN oncologist, I mean, they're doing it themselves now. And I'm, I'm just saying, they haven't published it yet, but what they told me, I mean, reduced opioid consumption significantly. And I said, even though the mechanism of it is not what you think versus the epidural in terms of pain control, patients are doing really well with these big incisions. And, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, so yeah, but yes, yes. Um, yes, uh, you focus mostly on like incis incisional surgery. Um, I'm just thinking about some of our short-term ambulatory type patients like of uteroscopy and stents, and then we're kind of doing catch up in the recovery room and we want to discharge it, but sometimes they're not tolerating their surgery and stents. Is there anything you would suggest pre-op and uh, intra post-op just to kind of get those patients not to have, you know, colic, stent colic, you know, oh, yeah. gonna keep them comfortable not to in pain, yeah. I mean, if you're trying to avoid opioids, I think you have to develop, you have a protocol in place where you, like what we have now for a lot of these uh, surgeries is there's like a template in Epic and the, the orders are written by surgeons the night before as far as their pre-op analgesic, you know, okay, gabapentin, uh, you know, celecoxib, uh, whatever it is. So, I mean, just max out on, you know, simple things like uh, celecoxib, um, PO Tylenol or IV, um, you know, about gabapentin again it comes up all the time but if you're trying to max out on all of these things for you know ambulatory patients probably not a great idea i routinely give them all toradol um at induction and the anesthesiologists say well why don't we give it at the end so that yeah. it lasts longer like, the case is 45 minutes. it's a short case it's right. that acts for eight hours so you what kind those of usually do? 30 some of the anesthesiologists yeah. say 15 is just as good as 30 and that's kind of the point of the iv injection um Obviously, cautious because they're older, they have renal impairment, and other kinds of issues. Um, some of the yeah. CGLs are really anxious about giving it in patients with asthma, um, even if they don't have necessarily you know, a known reaction to asthma, but they just want to give it in case they need it for that. Um, and other techniques, just surgically, is you know keeping the bladder as empty as possible, which is something that we can control. Um, operating as quickly as you can. Yeah, fifteen is probably just as good as. 30, yes. Yes. Very well. Um, so it seems like there are some limitations, though. So can you uh, speak to that? So what patients are ideal candidates, which patients are not? And thirdly, is it uh, proper for the um, surgeon to ask the anesthesiologist to give ketamine? Yeah, I honestly, I mean, some anesthesiologists are definitely reluctant to do it because they're worried about the side effects. I would argue that your chronic 
if you're going to choose your patient the patient population, your chronic pain patient, patient opioids or in, you know, with chronic pain or combination, certainly I think it would be your primary candidates. And certainly, you know, bigger procedures. I'm not talking about like a very short ambulatory procedure where you put them on ketamine. That's not what we're talking about. I was thinking more in terms of, you know, intra-abdominal surgery or pelvic surgery. Uh, definitely, I would target if you, you know, we're going to try to convince your anesthesia colleagues to use ketamine, certainly on that patient population, whether it's an infusion or even just a small bolus of two or three cc's, you know, 30 milligrams or something like that. But I would argue that a wider patient population is certainly eligible to get either a bolus of ketamine intraoperatively or be placed on an infusion. If, you don't, if you're not comfortable continuing it in a packet, that's fine. But even running it intraoperatively, we know the literature is out there, systematic reviews are out saying significant impact on you know, re reducing opioid consumption. There's always, you know, so there are some patients with psychiatric illnesses, you know, PTSD and certain other things, you know, bipolar. I mean, there are some things where, you know, you may not want to do that, you know, but so think about that. But I think vast majority of patients could benefit from either a bolus or an infusion, you know, yes, there's gonna be some side effects, um, you know, which we know about, but definitely target first your chronic pain pop, which is a huge number. I mean, it's like 20% of your patients, with at least. Regards, with regards to the side effects, how long would a potential delirium or I don't know if they have hallucinations or whatnot, how long would it last if it's offered to you? Is it like several, uh, even the next morning till top day number one, or is it just several hours? After? It's short acting, it's short acting. So it'll, it'll go away, I mean, you know, especially even with an infusion, if you stop it, you know, in, yeah, post, you know, intra-op, uh, the small bolus, they're not gonna have anything because you give it in the beginning, then three hours later, you know, it's short acting. Ketamine is pretty short acting, but you will see some of it <clears> from <throat> infusions. So there's a there's subset of patients that may not be, you know, good candidates, but vast majority are, but I would start with the chronic pain patients makes a huge difference. And if you can continue them in the PACU or even the floor, <laughs> you know, that's the logistical issues in certain cases. But, yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.